Welcome Pirate Monkey Crew to this third part of the painting colored armor tutorial series. Today we are going to be painting blue. I'm, I'm super excited about painting this blue uh, and this is actually my, my first chance trying out these new Kimeta color. I'm glad that I get to share a couple of different things with you at the same time. So uh, essentially what I'm doing here is I am starting out with the Thalo Blue Red Shade. Uh, this is a cool blue. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, the blue actually takes longer to get around the color wheel than the green shade would back to yellow. And so that means that it's essentially cooler. What I'm doing here is I have it thinned down to kind of a, a heavy glaze consistency. I'm wanting to cover, but again, uh, just like with the other videos, we are really wanting to leave those shadows and highlights somewhat intact. This is a very simple color scheme. Uh, we're really only going to be using four colors for the entirety of the armor. Uh, if you guys don't have the key meta color, I would highly recommend using Vallejo Dark Prussian Blue and Ultramarine or Reaper Clear Blue and something like their Sapphire Blue just because you really just want to get that warm, cool blue contrast, uh, you know, going on. And uh, even even blues really have a warm and a cool contrast going on. And blue is inherently a cool color. Again, if we cut the color wheel in half, you know, right here, we can kind of see that these colors tend to be warmer in nature and these colors tend to be cooler in nature. And so, of course, blue is uh, definitely a more natural, cool color. But uh, within that and how color is relative, there are cool blues and warmer blues. And so we're going to take advantage of that to kind of build in some more contrast. As you can see here, the, the paint is kind of fighting me in some areas, and I'm pretty sure this is to overhandling the model. Uh, I've moved the models around by hand quite a few times, and my wife has as well. And so essentially what you're going to see here is that the paint just really does not want to stick on certain areas. And you can see it there on the, uh, the back of the leg. Uh, there's a couple of points on the shoulder pads, and the, the helmet will get that quite a bit. I'm going to show you a technique uh, or a method that we have used in the past to help work around that if it's something that you're experiencing so that you don't feel like you have to just dump the whole thing in simple green and start over again, which I would highly advise you against. So there's always a solution to move forward and I, I would hate for you guys to feel like you have to move back if you're encountering the same solution. So something else that I wanted to talk about is uh, this tutorial, uh, it ended up taking me longer in general to paint this full marine than with the previous ones. And essentially it was partially due to testing out the new colors uh, and then also having to fight this this these oils that are on the the miniature a little bit you can see it right there really really badly you know i also just wanted to take my time on one of these i know we've been doing a ton of them super super fast kind of in that hour and under mark i think this one took me between hour and a half to hour 40 to paint so there's nothing wrong sometimes with you know if you want to take your time just a little bit more and apply these same techniques definitely do that uh, there's no need to rush initially and Honestly, I would say take your time the first time around and then speed up. And I really hope that these these techniques have been helping the gamers out there. Um, this is kind of a the the mission of these colored armor tutorials is definitely to teach you a little bit of color theory and some new techniques and tricks uh, on how to how to paint your armies faster. You know, even if you you are a display painter, I hope these videos have been helping you out.
Okay, so for the, the second round of glazing, I'm just going to go ahead and pop this into a time lapse just because uh, I, I don't want the I don't want the video to go on and on forever. It's already going to be a, a somewhat long video at a half hour for you guys. So, but anyway, uh, essentially just going around uh, at, as per the usual, pushing the color into the shadows. With this blue, uh, I would say it's especially important because blue is such a dominant color. If you mix white in with blue, or essentially any color with blue, you will find out very, very quickly that blue will dominate that color like none other. Uh, it really overpowers everything, uh, and especially you know if you you have something like the Chimera colors, which are pure pigment, it, it's even double so. So just keep that in mind when you're you know if you're kind of mixing here and there, or you know you're wanting to create shadows or highlights with blue. Again, massive shout out to my sponsors at Kimeta for providing these colors. The they're, they're just so, so vibrant. I feel like the camera only captures, uh, I would say about two thirds of it if you want to be really exact, but they, they just are so, so intense. And I think you guys are able to see a little bit of that with this cooler blue. They they almost just vibrate. I don't know another term for it. They, they just glow, not quite like a fluorescent color would, but just fantastic. <laughs> and especially if you're wanting to paint like a group of models fast in a single tone, like pure pigments are definitely the way to go, whether they're Kimeta color or, you know, another brand, just want to make sure that you're getting like a single pigment type of paint. And again, some of the, some of <laughs> this paint is kind of fighting me. As you can see, I try to pause the brush there for a second, just to kind of keep it there and th that'll work sometimes. But this, these next steps are really going to help with that. Hopping into this next phase, essentially what we're going to be doing is we are going to be using the airbrush just like before with the yellow tutorial uh, in order to do a couple of things for us, right? The first is to create additional highlights and, you know, essentially to create more intense contrast and just kind of build that contrast in. The second reason why though, particularly with this is that it's really going to help us with the adhesion of that paint. Um, this is something that I'll do if I'm having problems with adhesion is I will come in with an airbrush and spray over those areas, potentially just a, just a touch to help control it. The other thing that you can do is you can just kind of have a little bit of a thicker paint, paint it over, dry it really, really fast with a hair dryer. And you don't want to go too thick, of course, because you don't want it to build up. That's kind of my, my trick for working over uh, an oily spot uh, if I'm having that kind of issue. Coming in with the airbrush here, trying to be very, very particular about the shapes that we are hitting. Uh, if you don't have an airbrush, of course, you can do this with a rattle can this is definitely something that you can do i would just try to get the highest highest angle honestly i would just recommend spraying it from directly above just so that you get the most contrast out of that that really is the name of the game here right is contrast we want to have an even mix of our highlights midtones, and shadows just so that it isn't too dark or too bright that's really it for the airbrushing and so next what we're going to do here is i have the thalo blue green shade and I've added in just a touch of white. Uh, the reason being is that if you don't add in white to it, it can it can stay kind of dark and we want the coverage to be a little bit better than before. And so what we're doing here is just, we have it into kind of a medium glaze consistency because we want that white to really help us bring those highlights out. Uh, but we also want the paint to cover somewhat. And so uh, when you're doing this, you, you really don't want the the amount of white that you add to be super, super dramatic, uh, just enough that it lightens the color up for you just a little bit. And what I'm doing here as well is I'm trying to kind of push it up into the highlights instead of into the shadows. And so that way we, we get that accumulation at the top instead of at the bottom. And as you can see, it's a super, super lovely color. In some areas though, I'm, I'm really just doing a a complete tinting, meaning that I, I just don't have a lot of paint on the brush. I'm trying to evenly cover that surface. And if we go over the surface and into the shadows a little bit, thankfully the shadows uh, with that phthalo blue red shade, as well as the black, they're really going to dominate this, this brighter color. It's not really going to change things too dramatically, but if we went over the, those shadows too many times, then it would become a problem. They would start competing and it could look a little bit streaky or uh, not super well blended. Anywhere where I'm seeing a little bit of that white powder from the airbrushing, I'm trying to go over it. And as you can tell as well, uh, we're not having those problems with adhesion anymore. The reason why that happens is, you know, if you're using an airbrush or a rattle can is it's spraying those small particulates and they're kind of like 
attaching to whatever surface that they are sprayed onto uh, very, very well. Usually the, the adhesion of those paints is just super, super good. And it's creating kind of a, a, a speckled surface, essentially. If you look at it, you know, through a microscope, uh, that's what you would see. And what that allows the paint that we're applying on top to do is really stick to it very, very well. That's also why when you airbrush or use a rattle can, in a very light-handed way, the paint tends to feel a little bit more matte. And essentially the reason why is the light is kind of getting lost in that surface. It's just bouncing and getting scattered all around and not really bounced back directly to your eye that a glossy or a satin surface might. You know, if this is your first video uh, and you you guys decide to go back and watch the other videos, I, I do my best to explain the what and why we are doing, but I would say it's also uh, a fantastic practice if you, while you're watching these videos, are asking yourself the same questions. Uh, really make sure that you're watching and the whole time going, hey, why is he turning the model this way? Why is this the tone that's being used? You know, how can I use this not only in this specific type of project, you know, painting blue, but how, can I use this in other ways? Can I, can I use this uh, in a way that, you know, he may not have originally intended? Because uh, essentially what you are doing if you do that is you are, you're kind of building up a, a library of tools that you could potentially use or experiment with, with your other projects. So uh, just a quick note and just something that I, you know, I used quite a bit to improve my own painting. Uh, and it's something that I used to improve my own painting uh, in a somewhat rapid way in the, in the early days, back in the good old days. <laughs> Again, you guys, uh, I just want to point out, you know, you can do as much or as little of these steps as you want. If you want to do one glaze of, you know, that, that Prussian blue or the Thalo blue red shade, uh, airbrush it over it and then do one coat of our highlight tone, you can do that. And it's going to look really nice as well. Uh, with this one, I just wanted to take a, a little bit more care. This is kind of like gaming plus it is kind of not quite high tabletop, but um, it, it's, it's not quite gaming anymore right just because we're we're upping the complexity a little bit more and so i i want to give you these tools as we go to do things better if you would care to uh or not you know what i mean just because everybody's needs are going to be a little bit different uh some people are going to want to work faster some people are going to want to work slower and and add a little bit more and again hopefully you guys can see sometimes i'm really pushing the paint in a certain direction other times i'm just kind of slapping it on there uh, and here we are coming back and applying a second round of the exact same color. So uh, here we, uh, what we did is we we went over and we base coated all of the larger elements with a little bit of uh, essentially nightshade purple, uh, which is I, I just mixed a little bit of black with a little bit of the violet tone from the Kimeta colors, and then we're using the exact same black tone to come through and really pick out this detail the way that we always do, the way that we always come back and really accent all of this. And this is uh, kind of a dark lining technique, but if you are wanting to paint something for the tabletop, this is a really really fantastic way of just building in a lot of contrast really, really quickly. The other benefit that it's gonna have is it's gonna teach you, you know, better fine motor control, better brush control. It's gonna teach you to paint more precise lines. And so there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, this is one of those steps that I would say is optional, but if you want to improve your painting, you know, beyond just the, the basic get it on the table army type of painting, this is uh, an incredible way to do it. it. It does take some patience and some effort. My wife has been doing this actually. I've been pushing her to do this more and more. Her level of painting has improved dramatically from you know, even from her second to her fourth miniature.
there's some areas like that bottom part of the knee plate that's just getting completely base coated black essentially uh, and the reason being is that it's it's facing down right if it's facing down like that then I, I really don't mess around very much I just paint it black uh, there's not much point in things that are really really down turned like that especially if they're flat getting a ton of light unless you really want to get fancy and that's of course not the goal right now again though uh, another big part of it is is that it creates contrast and another part of the reason why i am very insistent upon using a near black tone for this is i noticed that a lot of people have difficulty understanding what contrast is when they're first getting into painting and essentially using a, just a super super dark color like black in this manner is really helping train them like hey this is as dark as it gets uh and on the flip side of that you know using really really bright white for instance if you're painting nmm is that it really forces you to understand how to use the entire range of the grayscale chart, which I, I refer to as value. It's just something that is, it's something that's invaluable. Um, <laughs> not to make a pun or anything, but it's just, uh, it's something that if you learn how to control those brights, darks, and kind of middle tones very, very well, your painting will only get better from that point if you are really trying to understand it. This is my little way of trying to sneak it in. Okay, and so from there, we're very quickly jumping into doing edge highlighting. Um, the other thing that you'll see me doing here, uh, just like right there, is I'm kind of going across the surface. If it's it's a if it's a thin surface, and I want there to be a little bit more of a pop of a highlight, you won't see me doing that though on the big broad surfaces. But um, again, something that I I want you to pick up on and notice as I'm doing this is I'm turning the model so that the brush is at the right angle on the model. I'm never, I, I, I do change the angle of the brush uh, somewhat here and there, but it's never dramatic and really, really keep an eye on my right hand because the angle of that brush and the way that I'm moving the brush rarely, rarely ever changes, uh, maybe just in a subtle way. And uh, another thing to take into account is that uh, watch my watch my hand. I'm I'm almost always bracing myself either on the model or on the base, as you can see there. And sometimes, uh, and I think you will see this in a, a little bit of a later part. Sometimes, if I have to, I will brace it on my other hand, generally like pinky to pinky finger. A part of the reason is is that the the hand that's holding the model, almost my entire forearm, is set down on the model, and sometimes even the model is set down on the table itself. I definitely have the benefit of having a, a desk that, you know, comes up to kind of like the, the bottom of my chest and so I can really, really brace my arms. Uh, taking some more time here going through and highlighting uh, each of the fingers just very, very quickly. We're not spending a ton of time on that. We're just taking a bit more care with this model. If you can't do that though, I would highly recommend that you pick up a small box so that you can at least brace uh, your elbows as well as your wrists. And that way you have just an incredibly, incredibly stable platform to paint these models on. And it's it's definitely a technical thing that warrants talking about. And uh, you'll, you'll notice in some of these areas when I, I edge highlight quotation marks, I'm actually attempting to draw a straight line. Uh, there's some areas where you, the surface is, is quite obtuse instead of being uh, more acute where you can really get the brush in and let the, let the brush do the work. Um, and so when that happens, I, I do come in and just paint a very, very thin straight line. And again, that's partially why doing that lining work is going to come in handy because when you are approached with something that's a bit more difficult, like freehanding a straight line like that, you will be much more confident when you approach that type of, that type of subject. And, you know, even then we're building a little bit of a platform if you want to do like simple freehands, right? Uh, really the next step with freehands and you can go go watch our introduction to freehands video is 
we paint a very, very simple object and we really, really map out, you know, the dimensions of the object, the basic shapes of the object. And then of course we're building in detail. And so doing this dark lining and then doing the, this edge highlighting where we're painting these thin straight lines and, you know, learning how to control that brush. Those are the first steps. Those are the building blocks of, you know, how we get from here to here. All right, guys, so we are getting close to the end of the tutorial. And as you can see, we have quite a fantastic result. I'm, I'm really, really very happy with how this model turned out. And I hope that you guys have enjoyed watching this tutorial as well. I know it was a little bit longer than previous ones. Uh, the next video that we are going to be doing is we are going to be jumping in to the color green and exploring that a little bit more. I may try to do something a little bit different where I do uh, a couple of variants of that. So we do like a dark green and a, a, a more bright, uh, you know, lime green type of uh, type of tone in the same tutorial. But um, again, if you guys have any questions, I want to hear them. Thank you so much again for your support in February and, you know, uh, in this month as well. You guys are amazing. And the reason that I'm able to continue doing this type of job, I hope you guys are having a fantastic day and happy painting. Bye.